So I think one of the questions is why is this a top 21 video? And I can tell you that the purpose of the top 21 is not to put the most extreme, difficult things out there, but as we put the top 21 together, the feeling was that we wanted to put together a series of videos where surgeons would either be doing routinely or might be deciding to undertake a new procedure. And so there are, um, there, it's a wide range of, of videos that are in the top 21. Um, the other thing is that we're actually putting together a video that hopefully is going to be out in the next six to 12 months, uh, or two videos. One, are, one is going to be challenges of the top 21, which is sort of a tips and tricks type video, and the second is going to be advanced upper and lower endoscopy with therapeutic endoscopy uh, for upper and lower procedures. So it's all part of a, a continuum of the educational videos that we try and put out uh, from the committee. So that, that's why <laughs> this is a, a top 21 video. Question. So, um, what test do you use for H. pylori? So we um, actually um, actually biopsy the antrum and they um, culture the uh, tissue for H. pylori for us. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Our next speaker will be Dr. Pat Reardon, who will be talking from here, talking about uh, laparoscopic Nissen fundoplication. Ken and the committee um, both for the opportunity to present here today and uh, to be part of this uh, very important committee that created these videos. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Nissen fundoplication. So um, Ken asked us not just to, to play through the video, so I'm, I'm not going to. In fact, you'll see very little of my actual video in there. Um, that is my disclosure slide. And this is my Brady Bunch slide. And the reason <laughs> I put that up there is because the video itself has things in it about patient positioning, how to set up the room, all the various different technical steps it takes to complete a fund application. Uh, but most of those are pretty straightforward, so I'm going to primarily talk about um, the actual um, technique that I use to create a fund application because I think that's the thing which might be different from what most people have seen. Uh, we call it the geometry technique. And it's based on the original technique described by Tom Demeester and his group. And uh, if you look, they had a vertical pledget and that pledge was about a centimeter and a half long. It's subsequently been modified. They don't put any of those uh, pledges on the inside. They tend to end up in the esophagus. And in addition, they've added a suture above and below. So um, our total fund application is usually two and a half to three centimeters long. And this is the problem with laparoscopy, because this is how I learned to do a fund application from uh, my mentor, Paul Jordan. We'd stick a right hand in there and put the short gastrics into the palm of your right hand, take the bougie filled esophagus, just push your finger and dunk it. Uh, into your right hand, and it always created a very nice, correctly oriented fund application. But, and that's a picture that Paul uh, gave me from back in the open era. But you can't do that with laparoscopy. And so I'm going to show you how we do that. Now, even if you don't think that you like this geometry technique, if you're doing fund application, I think this next uh, little pearl here with the traction suture that everybody should try to utilize. Because once you've figured out where you want to go in the posterior fundus, uh, you can use this suture, and if you're new or if you're teaching people, it's very important because if they let go of the point you spent all your time choosing and it gets away, then you got to go do it all again. Uh, and we've published this data, and it's pretty straightforward. What we do is identify the spot we want to use in the posterior fundus and simply put a suture there, tie it, and cut it long. And then you take that suture and you lay it over here against the cruise and uh, then flip the thing over and grab it from the right side posteriorly and you can now bring your posterior or right side attraction point over to the right side and whatever other point you might use to choose your fund application you just get hold of and we usually do a little towel dry maneuver and then you bring those two things together anteriorly and you sew it and that's your fund application and all the time with trainees things happen which cause that traction point to be let go of and if the person on the left side pulls kind of hard, it takes everything back over the left side. So if you don't learn anything else, I think this little trick right there 
to be utilized by everybody. Now, what are the characteristics that we look for? We want symmetry. We want a properly located funnel application. The length is important. Obviously, how loose or tight it is is very important with regards to dys dysphagia. And then we would like our funnel application to be oriented just the way God left it with the short gastrics aimed at their bed after we've divided them. And we didn't just pull this stuff out of thin air. Uh, in 250 consecutive adults, put a 60 French bougie down and then actually measured the circumference of their esophagus. And then we uh, back calculated the diameter. So you can see the information for the group as a whole and then the female cohort and the male cohort, that's their diameter. And then you can see the normal curve as well for the group. And it's important because after we did regression analysis, it turns out that your age and your BSA are highly correlated with what your circumference would be if you had a 60 French bougie in place. So on the left side over here, what you see is uh, my concept of a completed fundification. You have a 60 French bougie filled esophagus and that has a certain diameter and then there's some additional room you put between the outside of the esophagus and the inside of the complete funnel application and that's exactly what determines how loose or how tight your funnel application is. And that line then becomes the um, inner diameter of your completed funnel application and this is actually the Excel table we use. So you put the patient's height and weight and age in at the top and watch the numbers down here at the bottom, they're all gonna change once the categories are filled, and this is pretty simple, we have down loose, that's a centimeter of slack, medium, that's 0.5 centimeter of slack, and if we put tight, and I do that for some young people that come in with GERD, then in theory there's no space at all between the outside of your funnel, the outside of the bougie and the inside of the funnel application. So I'm gonna show you the actual uh, technique right now, and so we're identifying the distal end of the left side of the esophagus, and this suture has been uh, pre-measured and cut based on that little table you just saw. And starting where the fundus meets the left side of the esophagus, we just stretch it straight. And now we've used that like a little ruler and measured out along the greater curve. We're going to retract that to the patient's right and inferiorly, flatten the back of the fundus, and simply swing it over until visually it makes an equilateral triangle. Once you let go, if you pull a little more, it will move. So we always pull after we let go. And in this case, I'm going to give a gentle stretch. You just push over. And watch where the end of the suture goes if you put a little back traction on it. And we're going to choose that point, and that point is going to be our traction point uh, that we're going to use to represent the right side of traction point or the posterior traction point in the fundal location. We use the endo stitch, just put a stitch there, tie it, and cut it long. Once the suture is in place and you've cut it, we take it and lay it against the left side of the mesh that you can see up there above. And that's gonna make for it to be easy to access from the right side in just a minute. Then we move the suture and simply stretch all this back out to the patient's left side so we can make a point on the front of the stomach. We didn't used to do this, but now what we do is we're actually gonna stabilize that area, let go with a retractor and simply flip it over so we don't lose the length it took for that suture to cross across the front there. You'd obviously give up three or four millimeters if you did that. And we simply re-grab the same point, stretch it out. We're going to make that same triangle on the front side here. And I think what this does is it allows us to accurately calibrate these things. So there we go, back to the starting point, equilateral triangle, a little counter traction, watch where the end of it goes, wherever the end of it stops there is where we're going to grab and put a suture. And the anterior suture, it's just a, a marking point. We don't need to use it to pull anything around. So um, we, we're just going to use a, a short suture. And this is why our hospital's so well off, because we make the maximum use of our sutures. We don't throw anything away. So now once the suture's in and cut short, that's the two traction points that uh, we believe will make a, a symmetrical, uh, proper, Fundification. So you grab that posterior suture and pull it up toward the patient's right shoulder, not downward. Most people want to pull down on it. And as soon as you see the knot, grab hold of the stomach because you don't want to keep pulling on that suture. If you pull hard enough, they will come out. And we're going to reach over and help the grasper from the assistant. And the jaws of those things are two and a half centimeters long. You bring those two points together anteriorly at 10 o'clock and that should create a symmetrical fundification. Little shoe shine. The short gastrics ought to be halfway between those two traction points as you look across the top of the fundus there. 
because those are equidistant. And then finally, I've skipped all the sutures going in. We do not put a fledget on the most superior suture. It'll always roll over and touch the esophagus, and it does, it may go in. That's the last plegeted suture. There's three of them. Notice that uh, tied against ourselves so that we didn't lift up on the sutures and maybe tear that out of the esophagus. And I use mesh, and I always put a right superior posterior gastropexy suture, and that's going to pull that fundus up posteriorly so the esophagus is laying in a little bit of fundus, and it won't ever come in contact with that mesh. And I've got that mesh in almost 400 people now, and I have not had any complications related to the placement of that mesh. But the main purpose for showing you this, it turns out this is not the top 21 video that's in the video. In fact, this is a video just made a couple weeks ago. This is my fellow, Michelle. And the whole point of showing you this is I'm going to show you the top 21 video in just a minute. And I think the benefit of this technique is Michelle, who's um, far less experienced than me, I believe has created a, a good funnel vacation that's equal to what I would have created um, had she followed the same technique and I wasn't there. So this is an endoscopy at the end of her case. You can see just a peak of the squamous mucosa. So that's a nice wrap. It's a three centimeter anterior wrap. And there's a well-formed flat valve internally. And so if you follow this technique, I think that you can um, create the same kind of funnelification that somebody like me with far more experience has done. This is actually the video from Top 21. This was created before we had high def in the OR. It's lower def, but that's the exact same operation that Michelle just created two years later. Short gastric at 180 degrees opposite the funnelification in the front. And you'll see the, um, the endoscopy here at the end is going to look just like the one Michelle made. And to me, that's really the benefit of this whole thing. If you follow this technique, uh, you can create the same calibrated funnelification as somebody with far more experience than you have. And really, um, to me, if you have a way of doing a funnelification but only a handful of people can properly perform it, well, it might be good for you and your practice. It's not great for patients as a whole. So I think the real benefit of this technique, if you, if you look at this last video, is that that's Michelle's, and then up comes... Uh, there's Michelle's there, and the other one's the one I submitted for the top 21. Those are really pretty similar-looking operations. I'd say that's the same operation. If you look at them from the outside, same thing. The difference is uh, hundreds of funnelications and difference of experience, and yet she's managed to recreate the exact same operation. So the rest of the video that you would see, I don't think there's anything um, unusual or uh, not too straightforward. A lot of people may not put mesh in there, but... Um, Really, I think this technique's primary benefit is that it allows uh, people of all levels of experience to end up creating the exact same operation. Thank you. This is the first question. Uh, I am a, it says, do you always use a prosthetic patch? And the answer is yes. Even if the uh, hiatus is not uh, significantly dilated, I think the key to that is if uh, that part's not in the video. We keep that mesh one half centimeter away from all the edges of the hiatal opening. Remember that when you operate, the diaphragm has been stretched radially, and when you let the gas out, it's all coming back in. If your mesh is already on the edge of the hiatus, then it's going to be on the esophagus when you're done. It's, it's hard to tell looking at that video because we didn't show you in the back, but it's very V-shaped. So the further anterior you go, the farther it gets from the edge of the hiatus, too. It, Question says, you put a bougie in everyone? The answer is no, we don't use the bougie at all anymore. There are reported complications. The whole purpose of this technique is that it duplicates exactly the, the way we would have done it if we had a bougie, but we didn't put it down. And yes, I always take the GE Junction fat pad off. I am very interested in knowing where the terminal end of the left side of the esophagus is. And if you let that fat on there, uh, a lot of these people, their distal esophagus, they have a dilated end stage esophagus and it gets sort of flute shaped. And if you don't look carefully, you will mistake um, the dilated distal esophagus for stomach and you'll put your wrap up too high. And then uh, that is Gore-Tex mesh. Uh, it's plain old Gore-Tex. It's uh, relatively inexpensive. It's far less expensive than all the um, proprietary brand new meshes that are out there. And they cut a special 10 by 7.5 centimeter piece for me and uh, we use that in every case. Uh, the pledgets, we use uh, Teflon felt pledgets. It says, what's the advantage of those? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm trained in cardiovascular surgery. I trained with Dr. DeBakey, and so when we did heart valves, everybody got a pledget. Why? Because you want to distribute the force of the suture. And then I learned this technique from Dr. Demeester, who's also a cardiothoracic surgeon. And the whole idea was the pledgets distribute the loads. So they don't pull through. But if you've ever reoperated on anybody, I know they say these are Teflon pledgets. They engender a tremendous scar. 
And I think that one of the reasons I have never found one of my uh, fund applications broken down anteriorly, I've had some fail and they get recurrent reflux, but never due to separation. When you go back, those EPTFE pledges have got everybody in the front really glued together. It does make it easy to identify the junction of the two halves if you have to do a redo, though. And I do a scope after every single fund application. Number one, I'm an old guy, and, and when I got out in practice, the private practice GI guys told me they had a real simple concept for me. If I did my own endoscopies, I could go find all my own cases, too. So until recently, I didn't do any cases, but as you probably know, the reimbursement has gone down for a whole bunch of stuff, and they don't want to do it. So I learned by doing endoscopy on all of my patients on every single case in the OR. I've actually taken down some operations that I had completed and declared um, very successful only to get done at the end and look in and either the squamal columnar junction, uh, which was not uh, misplaced due to Barrett's, was above the wrap. If you've done that, you've created a slip nissen. And on others, uh, the wrap I thought was actually too high and there was a bunch of squamous mucosa that you averted. In that case, I disassembled them and did them again. I think you answered that one already. Huh? Yeah, I put, it, the last question says, so I put uh, mesh in everybody, I put, put it in everybody. As I said, I've not had any problems, and I think the two reasons, number one, keep it a half centimeter away from the edge of the hiatus, and number two, make that fluffy little pillow in the back with a fundus. You don't ever want to let the mesh traverse the hiatal opening where your esophagus can get at it, because your esophagus moves a whole bunch of times every single day. Thank you. Oh, there's more questions. Yep. <laughs> Do I have any experience with post-op dysphagia? Uh, absolutely. If you do uh, fun applications and you do more than one, there's a good chance you've had some experience with it. What I've not had is what I consider to be um, an increase in post-op dysphagia that I believe is due to the mesh. I will say that if I reoperate for dysphagia, I'll redo the whole thing. That means redoing the hiatus and the whole fun application. Endo stitch looks good. The strength of the endo stitch is that I can sew very well. I'm happy to take anybody on in a suturing contest with a needle holder and a needle, but the left crura inferiorly and posteriorly basically bays itself over the aorta. And I, even I have been driving a needle back there sometime and had it torque while I was driving it. And it comes out and you don't know where it is. And for just a minute, you get real puckery because that's not much fun. <laughs> and I'm in a training program, and so I think the endo stitch is very safe. One thing you know for sure about the endo stitch, you can put the needle in anterior to the aorta, and wherever the free end of it is, in without a needle, when you toggle it, that's where that needle's coming out. It's always coming out where the other arm is. That's not true of free needles, and uh, I can tell you I've driven them, and it's real scary to drive it, and it doesn't come out where you thought it was going to come out. And the final question is, can you share the formula that's in that Excel table? I'd be happy to. Uh, I'm certain that Sages could um, arrange some way that you can, it's a locked uh, table, you put it online, if you put the height, weight, and uh, age in, what it's going to tell you is what it thinks their circumference would have been, and then you just have to decide if you want a loose, medium, or tight wrap. And after uh, 600 operations, that's exactly what I do still every day. When do you place clips? I don't ever put uh, clips in the top stitch. Um, if I want to identify a recurrent hernia, then we'll either put a scope down or uh, more preferentially do an upper endoscopy. Uh, <laughs> the final <laughs> question must be from a Texan. It says, is your bloating rate high? Uh, I don't think that my patients uh, are more bloated than uh, any other patients. That's actually um, the second highest risk I tell them about. The number one is I tell them all about the dysphagia because that's the one that's most likely to lead to dissatisfaction. But I tell them all, they're going to be, however gassy they are now, they'll be more gassy after I'm done with them. But uh, most patients would still redo their surgery even if they have gas bloat. So Pat, I, I do have one question for you. I've noticed that every now and then when I re redo an opera, a Nissen and someone who's had it done elsewhere, that the short gastrics have been taken down on the high part of the stomach, but they haven't gone far down enough on the greater curvature to allow the stomach to be mobile enough to, to be pulled around. How far distally do you take the short gastrics? I try to take all the short gastrics, so we always look for the, the insertion you of the gastric. You go down to the flowing. big body, yes. take off some, you do. Okay. And then my rule is wherever you started your dissection of the greater curve, you need to make a straight line to the inferior aspect of the left cruise, and no aspect of the posterior fundus could be attached on that path because the, for sure that's the path your posterior fundal vacation is going to follow. Do you take the highest posterior as well then? Yeah, right? I take, I free okay. the entire posterior aspect of the fundus over that entire area. Thank you very much. Thank you.